Hello everyone, today we talk about the Frankish tactics during the Crusades. We have already addressed this topic indirectly, talking about, for example, the Crusading mounts. Uh, it's a video specifically dedicated actually to the mounts, both of Frankish Crusaders and also of the Iberian Reconquista. And also we have done, at this point, several videos about specific battles of the Crusades from which uh, you know there are possibly the best um, ex exemplificatory mean to show what tactics were really about so we have already discussed about this stuff at length as you know I have a, a Crusades playlist so it's all there and naturally this could fit well as we will see now Western tactics broadly meant right we, we could think that essentially Frankish tactics uh, in Outremer were actually the same as the ones employed in Europe right and that we discussed also already I think in a specifically um, general video dedicated to the topic in theory but even for that the battle videos are better right um, there are indeed uh, some differences that however we shouldn't stress as categorically what happened in Europe. We have stressed countless times how it's basically nonsensical to say, you know, in, in, the, in the 12th century, you know, these knights fought only in that way and only because they were in that country or another. It, it doesn't have make any sense, right? And there is also, aside from the famous, you know, um, close order charge, it was naturally at this point kind of the most distinctive um, aspect of uh, of wef western warfare in open field um, you know there is really a, an enormous range of obvious adaptive capabilities and that were probable armies at that time we're not talking about a, a set piece of uh, you know battle that that was fought only in the near east or uh, or in the Iberian peninsula or in central europe um, warfare was largely uh, homogeneous with only some you know minor yet substantial differences that had mostly to do with with the politics in the societies that produced those armies as always and and naturally there is all an emphasis that derives from the crusade in itself from whatever sources you're reading both the Christian or Muslim ones that after all pretty objective right those authors uh, back in the day were fair more objective than what many people are today object look at this um, this stories that in fact tell us uh, and and also what they don't properly tell something you that they still make us understand right uh, how after all these cultures were fairly um, sympathetic to one another they shared a lot and especially the military elite as a you know looked at war as a raison d'etre was you know proper the the aristocracies of all these wars were many points in common naturally a lot of hybriding going on uh, in the process and as we've seen also for other videos for example the ones uh, on the one on the Turkopoles or the Franks in the uh, in, in Byzantine in the Seljuk armies for example we see that even in here try trying to attempt distinctions it's very difficult and also naturally religion has basically nothing to do with that um, we have seen it for example for the uh, on the video on the modern needs of Syria that of course shared much more with the broader near Middle Eastern military culture and Western one and of course they fought alongside the Crusaders that are more in general we have seen that were so many Muslims in Christian armies as many Christians in Muslim armies so I think I've repeated that enough times to be now uh, absorbed. I will keep stressing it as maybe the numbers of followers will keep rising. But this is definitely not one of those channels that you watch because you think that you you know your football team is cool and that you're special according to that. And this channel actually doesn't give a damn, and this content is explicitly designed to keep away people who reason like that because they're objectively useless. Uh, intellectually speaking, I mean that they don't they don't bring any improvement or intelligence or you know critical capacity uh, to anywhere. Uh, but aside from this, uh, you know there is we, we should look at the sources and all and and naturally 
understanding what were the emphasis that the sources were putting even just in describing something relatively secondary as tactics, right? Secondary, as we have seen, in relative terms, because of course, medieval warfare in general, pre you know, pre-modern warfare in many ways was fundamentally constituted. But what the army was composed by, right? It wasn't such a degree of complexity of 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 units that deployed in such an enormous enormous quantity and an enormous pace were usually these three major lines uh, fighting in you know in, in the space of a few kilometers most of the times that may sound actually a lot because you think you know the the, the battles were fought in short distances actually they weren't right and in fact in order to understand with with better how the, the dynamics we should you know get acquainted also with this broader you know logic that of course has primarily a strategic even for the tactical reason we've seen it very well I think uh, given the examples that we, we discussed in, in the battle videos but think for example as an image as the, the famous charge that could quote make a hole through the walls of Babylon right this idea that you know the Crusaders coming from the West could pierce through fundamentally uh, the wall near uh, and Middle East arrived Babylon to, and to, to make it to make its um, walls crumble. Right, this idea that uh, was shared, after all, uh, also by the Byzantines and the Muslims when they looked at Frankish knights, and to them, of course, they were, you know, barely civilized people. They were, you know, uh, in, indisciplined, disrespectful, kind of vulgar, gross in many ways. But there was one thing they objectively recognized to them, and this is something that predates, um, you know, even these times, the Crusades, something you can find easily in the, um, you know, Pseudo Maurice's uh, stra Strategicon about the so called blonde haired peoples, as it's uh, titled, relative chapter, that objectively these guys were at least behaving as if they considered themselves as the most courageous people in the world their charges were fundamentally the the most dangerous feature of the, of their tactics and surely at this time uh, western western uh, chivalry was developing uh, along these patterns that we can't properly call frankish because the things started from there eventually spreading all over western europe during the time of the crusades if not actually beyond especially by the 13th century um, the the Near East uh, went through a sort of I can't say of necessarily Francization proper, but you know the the, the idea of, of a feudalism of a seigneurial rule expanding throughout this times, except very specific areas of the Mediterranean that also were technically Frankish in nature um, would to would take over, especially by the time the Crusades were over. Right, it was such a, a deep exchange. Historiography has always looked at mostly what what did in, in a western centric perspective was that, that the west you know brought back from the crusades right and um there the, the were even some, some provocative answers like just peaches for example because it, uh, at the end the thing failed or at least uh, because you know convention at least you know we think about acre but the crusades went on for for centuries and centuries up to the 17th uh, it's even there all a, a different ideas we should have but we should also ask ourselves how much did the West actually export in those times right which is and and the answer actually is also it got back a lot that cannot be quantified in you know mechanical material um, necessarily technical terms it's most a matter of ideas right the West at this point as you know from the other medieval history videos uh, that I made I don't think by the 12th century had properly nothing to envy to the rest of, of these worlds, right? As we were saying at the very beginning of this video, everything was way more homogeneous, we think, than we think since the beginning, but properly there are many hints that uh, show us also in terms of military logic, if you just study um, warfare in this regard, that th this idea that some what the, the Crusades were this uh, awakening of the West from a previous sleep um, is a very perspectively falsifying uh, perception, right? It mostly derives also from, a, you know, even here a bias that developed, especially in certain countries in the West, 
that does not look especially at what was happening in southern Europe in the previous centuries, that where we see there that the, the, the opening to the, west, to the east and the interaction and the improvements were, you know, dramatic and evident, evident since, you know, if, we, if you look at those videos I made on the Crusades and I think, I don't remember what the title is, but like, it's something like about the prodromes of them or whatever, you know, the Crusades were something dramatically impacting, but it, it, of course, from an international point of view, but the, in terms of innovation, they should be mostly regarded as such um, in terms of easily of, of papal history, of ecclesiological history. I mean, it's not even about what uh, what those wars were about in the Near East, but probably in the struggle for the investor, in the, first of all, in the reform papacy, and all what that entailed in the broader and sure, development that happened in those years very fastly on the world continent, but chiefly in a um, in a, an ecclesiastical sense. But we we talk about military technologies or you know just tactics in this regard. I think this idea of the borrowings um, are just a myopic approach to, to military history. They do not um, give their due to properly the historical difficulty, the, I mean the historical evidence that we have in terms of simply things that we cannot know because at the times historiography didn't write about certain things and the chances are from all the hints we get that actually we're already there way before the Crusades, you know that even just a revival of the year 1000, it's something that we, we, we talk about because we have the sources that talk from the year 1000 but if you just you know, stop and, and read what they say, you realize that what they, they say is happening at that point, it's obviously something that started way before, right? Because it, it talks about a development that has already uh, fulfilled itself. So whatever this broader expansion or development, whatever you want to call it, um, was about, wasn't, uh, you know, the Crusades dramatically fluidified it in, in some ways, but it, they were already the, the consequences of it at, at many levels. And that video I made, in fact, on the the myth, uh, yeah, that, that's what it was, the, the myth of the poor Crusaders' mounds, right? That was objectively, a, you know, a historiographical myth that was invented in the West. It is also very fascinating that there isn't not much of a, it's mostly the West that, that is obsessed about this idea of uh, the clash of cultures and civilization that produced in a modernistic and technologistic way in, in the previous, you know, a few generations from now, this idea that somewhat the, the characters of what, what I don't know, the, the, the scientific or the industrial revolution would come, were, were rooted in here. Um, and trying to look at it from a, you know, from a technological point of view, which is ridiculous. Right, it was. Um, I believe that there was something to that in the, at the root um, that is even probably deeper than we usually think, but it was mostly moral. Right, most of this it's all about moral forces, as warfare is, as we have uh, learned from phone clauses. Right, it's not a, a change that occurred because you know the Crusaders started you know copying the faint flights of the Turks because before nobody had ever thought about it or they they would have they would have not been capable of doing it. Right for for people that spent their their entire life on horseback, do do you think they they couldn't achieve that on a regular basis, especially that level of collective training they had gained already by, by that point? I mean, it's ridiculous, and there is no evidence of any or any kind of kind of backwardness compared to th this rest of the wars. But we shouldn't even think it in these terms. That is, I'm not saying this because I presume, ah, oh, no, no, the West was so cruel and so proud. No, no, I'm, I'm probably properly stressing the fact that, that the world was that flatly homogeneous and yet dynamic at the time. So that we should understand where we should shift the attention to, to what made eventually things happening to, to way, you know, other levels, right? Way less trivial matters than what kind of weapons, which kind of tactics you use, because at the end of the day, especially from a technological, you know, I mean, technology is probably the, the least important aspect in, in, in this uh, in this world military history here. Um, renowning, right? It, it is really so, actually, you know, there are those people who think that World War the First was fought like that just because of machine guns or, you know, sh or shells. And that's how unfortunately we have been nurtured mentally speaking and it's dramatically hard to, to, to make a breakthrough in these misconceptions even just because someone 
maybe has founded such, uh, you know, uh, such convictions, looking just at the tip of the iceberg, right? And not looking at the iceberg uh, underneath for, for its real, you know, in its real dimension. This is a bit of a methodological note, but I think it's necessary to, 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 to address this topic in general. Um, first of all, the first criticism that is usually said is, you know, yeah, the, this, the Westerners now, the, the Franks, we, we, let's call the, them the Franks broadly, broadly meant, um, were, yeah, the, they could make this dramatic sh uh, shock charges, they were pretty good at it, possibly the best at doing that, in, in, if, if anything, on a matter of scale, because of course, all these other cultures had shock cavalry that were capable of performing exactly the same thing. The, the problem is what, you know, what is the measure of that? And that's a political and social uh, problem, right? Um, the Near East, the Byzantine Empire, this time they, w they weren't really feudal, right? They were surely, you know, in comparison to our own societies, feudal in many ways, but compared to what, what was happening specifically in Western Europe, they weren't as feudalized. So as a consequence, you don't have a strong cavalry fundamentally if, if you don't have a um, a feudal society and um, in terms of shock charge and so on so uh, of course the, there is there is um, uh, a fraction of it that can bring on the field of course even good amounts of shock you know of, of heavy cavalry that is capable of performing dramatic shock charges but the quantity is another thing and you know that stereotypically speaking the Muslim armies are uh, represented as mostly just swarms and swarms of horse archers, which, which is technically true, right? But still there was a shock component. And also the Crusaders did use the same horse archers, as we have seen brilliantly, the Turkopoles, right? It's not that the Turkopoles are even like something special, or if you if you go on, on YouTube, you search for the Turkopoles, aside from my videos, you find other videos that say, oh, wow, look, the Crusaders used horse archers, what's a special thing? Why? Would you ever think that, like, well, you go fighting in a place where horse archers are all over the place, and and, and what what's what's the surprise? What what's the point, right? Aside from the fact that every uh, every knight at the time knew perfectly knew how to use uh, a, a bow on horseback because that's all what he did when he went hunting, for example. And even in there, there's a lot of shared culture in common these col um, between th these peoples. But secondly, you know. What do you think armies are made of? Just a war game mystic roster pack of troops that you know cannot become anything different than and that are stereotypically obviously Christian and Muslim armies were much more similar, right? Than 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 they seem apparently. And there is also the problem in here properly of of what we do we know because the, the Christian sources at this time, for example, weren't so. Um, interested, it's not they had to hide that, but were probably they didn't care very much to stress that the Crusaders, for example, fought alongside Muslims, for example, or these horse are these local natives that they properly didn't give a damn, also for, in fact, exactly political and social reasons, not because they were much foreigners. Yes, there is a bit of xenophobia even in there, we find it some in some orders and the videos on the Turkopoles it's quite evident, but there is properly the political and social contempt towards anybody who wasn't a knight, who wasn't an aristocrat, that was true also in Europe, right? You know, it's not this is not an harmonic world in which everybody was, you know, as some people like to draw the Middle Ages in their ideal everybody liked charities was were perfect so in, in Europe, um, if you were a peasant, you were fundamentally a subhuman for a knightly thought, right? There was nothing proud to share, you know, for example, a common origin with a peasant. This uh, identitaristic sense of idea of, you know, of, of Europe versus other worlds, it was absolutely uh, unknown, right? These people actually drew as knights that their prestige from the fact that they were elite and they were defined by that. And the rest of the people were truly practically racially inferior because they were compared to animals. They were not even compared as human, barely, were barely human beings in many ways, right? And this was the mindset, that was the first divide, right? And this was true in part actually in the Islamic world, but even though that was a, by certain standards, a, a less stratified society, and therefore there were also other approaches that have to do also with a lot of other cultural um, factors. But properly speaking, you know, if you're not a, if you're not a knight, 
you don't count anything. So what's the point for a chronicler that most of the times where the Crusades came from areas like, like France, so the, the very heart of that um, you know, aristocratic ethos, to, to say that knights fought alongside people that weren't knights. Right? We have actually lots of evidence, even from those sources, that knights fought alongside with infantry, with other troops. So it's not a mystery. But the point is that sometimes, I don't know, in a battle reconstruction, we don't, we don't often see quantitatively speaking, what, what in the action did these troops count? And we know that actually up to the 13th century, um, there is not, not even in Europe properly the acme of, of heavy cavalry, right? People think the Middle Ages were dominated by cavalry warfare. Actually, it is not true. Like, the only century in which cavalry was, and in Europe, let's say, unstoppable in, in a pitch battle, so that no infantry could basically defeat it, was the 13th century. If you look at before and you look at after, you, you immediately find infantry that could stand their ground and, 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 uh, and even defeat a cavalry charge. It's fairly rare, surely, for the, especially the, the central Middle Ages, this is, it is rare, but it's not even so, um, uh, you know, difficult to, to, to find or to know, to realize that there were other components that could, uh, could oppose even a resistance in this sense. We were, we we're seeing a third battle of Ramla, for example, the su Sudanese infantry. In, in, in the Fatiban army, you, you know, stood for a, for a whole day against the charges of, of Frankish cavalry, Sudanese troops, and you would say, wow, right, those guys, you know, we're talking about the 12th century, so, so already a very advanced stage of, 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 of Western cavalry development, right, but also, more especially, of course, it was, um, you know, un, um, you know, uh, obvious and uh, ineliminable cooperation between the various arms, right? Cavalry r rarely did, and this is probably even truer during the Crusades, so you want to find a shade of difference in that regard. Maybe Western Europe, it's not even to be stressed excessively, is that uh, infantry seems to have played a, a greater role as, as a shield for cavalry during the Crusades than in other, than in other circumstances, um, it will have become important also for other reasons we'll see now. But a cliche that, that is often, even in, in general, expressed is that fundamentally, yeah, the, the, West, the Franks had this dramatic shock charge ca capability, but they had to find, to, to carry that out against an enemy, it would just stand and take its full impact. And about this, we could spend like all the three hours of, of the day plan to, 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 to spend here because um, that is true from one side, but you know, a, a battlefield is, is not a basketball field. It's not that units, especially the larger they are, they have m many choice in the first place for whichever reason they are there to like a f feign flight or to simply retreat or avoid impact, right? Actually, even in there, the the battles show a substantial degree of symmetry, right? But it, it was kind of, uh, you know, more frequent by certain standards to see that, as we will see in, in a while, to be done at the strategical level rather than properly the tactical one, unless there was the you know, it was specifically planned, and there was actually um, a hidden reserve that could attack from 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 the flank. Because also feigning flight, it you know, it, it entails that you're abandoning also your order, your cohesion in part. I mean, there is an advantage, a disadvantage, and a risk within it in, in itself. And when look at how these armies fought, actually, the the really the options are way more leveled than they are seen at, at first glance, and not. And that is naturally to be um, stressed as, as a non-negotiable decision, after all, right? And, of course, horse archery, in this sense, was mostly meant to do that, right? A good, perhaps the best example we made is in the video about the Battle of Manzikert that shows largely, you know, what, you know, the same tactics from the Seljuk sides that, that the Crusaders you know, in, in a few decades would have themselves to, and the dwarf Franks even in the Byzantine army, as we've seen at that point. Um, so even the idea that the Crusaders discovered these tactics uh, when the Crusaders started, it's not true. Right? Westerners were all over the place, 
um, wherever it was being fought against um, uh, this this tactics generally speaking because also the, the Islamic world has actually is somewhat very variegated right actually way more than 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 the Christian one at this point so but Westerners had been fighting since generations if not centuries actually in, in Spain in southern Italy in 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 the Near East right regularly against these same people way before the Crusades began so even in their what a surprise, what a terrible thing, you know, we most, we, we, we should get used to the idea that most of the tactics we see here are not a matter of personal judgment, like the decision to attack maybe, but how that would be carried out and what, what the enemy react like is, is largely non, non-negotiable, right? And as I was saying, horse archery, of course, is designed exactly to be that, they're very light and, 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 and speedy cavalrymen. They have to exhaust their all their arrows and we see they were overloaded with them to, to, to bring this to the maximum effect, sometimes throughout the whole day. Right? Um, and and they, they couldn't close in because most of them were basically not even armored at some level. And uh, then all this for making you know the shock element of, of these of the Islamic army proper to at the end of all this wearing out attack, uh, hopefully to trying to break uh, the the Frankish army, uh, I'll find at the end, right? And or there were naturally other circumstances which instead the attack was was accepted even frontally. So even at least not that they were going to, to kill themselves just for the sake of it. Also from the other side, they expected what to uh, to to break, right? And there is also in here a very important. A distinction to make uh, for anybody who has studied these battles from the sources between the Christian, the Serbian, and the Islamic one, right? They are two very different systems of reference, right? The, the Christian historiography is way more detailed and kind of logical, rational. It has all it stems from 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 to uh, to this from Xenophon. I mean, the, the West has had properly a way to tell history in a very different way from this other. The reality is that had a, a way more transcendental approach. They didn't even care much for the detail. Of course, most of you know Crusader battles are dramatically better document, you know, are documented dramatically better from the Christian side than from the Islamic side. It usually, you know, gives maybe one information about the proportion of the. But they're, they're, these are also very archaic times, right? Also, Western Islam is very primitive compared to what it would be becoming the 13th and 14th century, especially. And that's also why we know so few, but for example, this asymmetry between the two historiographies sometimes makes us feel like, you know, it's all the, the Christian explanation, for a Christian side of the story. Maybe, you know, the Muslims actually would have said something that looks way closer, after all, than in, in, in strictly tactical terms than what the, also the Christians were saying. So, there is a bit too much of cliche going on, saying, you know, the, the Turks, after all, fought always in that way, and the Christians fought always in that way, but, but it, once again, it was probably way more leveled and much more homogeneous than we, than this stereotypical picture has obliged us to, to see uh, forcefully, because we, obli- I say obliged, because we don't have further evidence, but if you just study maybe the, the equipments, the, the, the general even from the strategical balance, you can understand a lot in this sense, but it's evident that there is a, an important um, difference for the time, but still on a plateau of homogeneity that, that is important to stress. Um, of course, and there is also this other point that, for example, Frankish cavalry being on average heavier and better armored, better armored we, we know it, um, heavier surely um, but in terms of, of mounts as we've seen also the other time there are even episodes that prove how Frankish cavalry could maneuver the enemy into a situation in which first of all it was impossible to evade the charge but on occasion on occasion even to pursue like the the fleeing Turks right so the Turks were lighter has on average had this this faster horses on average, we have evidence of Frankish cavalry being able to pursue 
Like most of the time, it's vague. Like it doesn't tell us. But maybe they were the turcopoles. We don't know that we can tendentially measure even this this dynamics. But sometimes we properly see that even in terms of mobility or in possibility of carrying out certain tech, it, it you know mm, there there was not this dramatic difference. There were also all a strategical background that fundamentally dictates even what the tactic has to be about, right? And um, it's uh, it's um, every battle naturally has to be studied on its own. But if you just think about all the times, I don't know, the Turks just attracted the Frankish armies in a in a on a difficult terrain from a properly from a strategical point of view, not a tactical one. The thing is often confused. But properly, you know, we're talking about entire days of marches. You have to think first that the Franks, if they were personally at this point, they were. They felt confident they could do that. It's not that they were idiots. Like you know, these are a bit of these cliches, like the the French that kept charging, you know, against during the Hundred Years' War against the uh, the the English men at arms, longbowmen, and, and and losing. It's not that they were doing that because they were stupid, or that because that was actually a bad idea. Because guess what? Most things that happen, militarily speaking, are dramatically rational, and they are properly. The only way to make it, and of course it was difficult, but still the moral forces behind that show you that evidently these people were confident enough to do it, and they they surely knew way better than we can ever think what the hell medieval warfare was really about, um, and and accept the challenge, right? And if you actually look at it in in perspective, and I'm not a great fan of this this idea, methodologically speaking, but I I'm building a, a specific um, you know, opinion that over time, that actually Frankish cavalry had an advantage on Turkish tactics, right? Uh, if you look at battles like Arsuf or other, you know, you always see that th those who were constantly wavering and, you know, trying to delay the, the contact to, to the very end and, of course, wearing the enemy out and uh, being very careful about it, were actually the, the Muslims, right? It was them who were you know, more limited in options than the Franks were. This idea, this defeatism of the guerrilla, of the ambush, that it's something that would bring back in the West, I don't know since when, since, you know, uh, Algeria or, or Vietnam or Afghanistan or whatever. It's actually nonsense, right? Historically speaking, guerrilla, uh, faint flights, uh, ambush, are actually d defeatable and more you know that they they don't actually express from their side much much of an option right if you recur to that uh, regularly we've seen it also in von Clausewitz as a tactic as a strategy it's it be because you're implicitly saying that if you met that per you know that foe in open field you you are at disadvantage right and we have evidence of of great episodes like our soup for example or others in which s Frankish charges were successful right, were very successful, right, so the myth that these guys could run away, could could hide, could do whatever they wanted, the Franks always fell in the trap, it's not really a real thing, right, it's, um, th there is even in here myths that are spread through, you know, maybe one author read, read a battle in a certain way, made some hypothesis, and that becomes mainstream, we've seen it recently, I don't remember which battle it was, the last battle we made, but I, I read the sources for the first time and actually uh, disagreed even with Runciman and others. And also let's be aware of the fact that not all people who study the Crusades are actually military historians. Like military history and history are not just like the military history is a branch of, hi of history like all the others. It's probably another thing, right? Separate is a completely different method. If, if you haven't specialized specifically in that field from the beginning of your studies, it's actually very difficult to say, okay, well, I, I will now read whatever battle and we understand the logic of it. We should study, first of all, lots of battles over time. This is what we're doing partly on, on Schwerpunk exactly regarding Crusades. And the three is uh, kind of a stereotypical um, balance in this regard. That, of course, is 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 modified by each contingental reality. But that seems to show in this regard that the, this alleged um, limitation of Western cavalry in, in no, near Eastern battlefields is, is that there is no evidence for it. 
right? It's obvious that a heavier cavalry has m more difficulties on, on, on that ground, but also that is designed contextually to something that is more flexible than, let's say, uh, an environment, right? Of course, geopolitics does not exist. And this is the thing we always say to, you know, to, to, to trigger those people who do. But properly, you, you can't even think that, I don't know, um, have you ever been in Southern Europe in, in, in summer, right? Do you think we, the, the Western Knights of folk there, how, how do you think we're, you know, do you think there is an evidence that says, I don't know, these Southern Europeans fought with different tactics compared to, to Northern Europeans? You know, heat in, in summer in Europe, wherever you are, is pretty damn hard. We have pretty a lot of evidence of everywhere in Europe of, uh, under the, the, the summer heat of uh, knights that even prefer to strip themselves of their armor. Right, because that's how you get under sun. Of course, the Near Eastern sun is, is worse, but and, and this brings to different uh, outcomes. Maybe, of course, it, it's pretty realistic that actually the, the, there would be also lighter equipment for that reason, right? But if anything, that was symmetric for, for the Christians and the Muslims as well. The Muslims suffer each, just like everybody else, and they may be more skilled, like they, they may know the terrain, better in certain circumstances, but it's not that every army knows the single terrain of the battle where we fight, most, most don't, but generally speaking, um, these are differences that are very easy to level, and what really makes a difference in the field of the force you employ, how you employ it, and um, if it was just about the weather and the environment, we would just think about the weather and the environment, that is surely very fashionable today, but when you study military history, you realize that it doesn't really count much in the end, right? Or it can, it can count, but it's, once again, it's the tip of the iceberg, while the bigger thing is decided way below, um, in many ways. Uh, there is also another digression I could make on the alleged introduction of the flank attack in Western tactics from through the crusading experience, which is something that I got interested in in my studies. It's something, as you know, starts mostly from the 13th century. Um, but even in there, um, I have my doubts, honestly. And I think it came from 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 this mix of this political, social, but also historiographical properly, that we don't know how it was before, the reasons. Right. Um, given this ground, it's obvious that the Turks prefer to make the best possible use of their principal advantages over the Franks. Right. Archery and mobility, no doubt. Horse archers were the backbone of all Turkish armies, quantitatively speaking, um, and also properly probably in the ba broader balance of force, given that, however, it was they, they still use combined tactics, as we have seen. Um, this is um, a reality that exists all, all over Eurasia, starting from the steppes, and we, we can find it from, from Syria to Central Asia. Uh, the, the Christian chronicles, of course, are full of references to the effects of Turkish archery. Right? The, the, there are showers of arrows, which fell quote, as though rain was falling from the sky, right? Um, William of Tyre, at, for the Battle of Dorylium, 1097, that is considered, in fact, as the, the first um, uh, open, you know, meeting, first direct meeting between, uh, sent by approximation, fully Western, fully um, Turkic uh, tactic, and it was, in fact, basically a Turkish defeat in this regard, because they, they realized they didn't make it true. There are people, uh, the, the Western armor especially, um, th there, there is a branch, I, I have never checked this from a strictly, you know, opological, a technological point of view, but people say pro properly the uh, Islamic armies improved their, their archery power properly from terms of, of bows and their construction, in order to be more effective against Western armor that on average was was tougher, right? For reasons that even here are like debatable, like, I, you know, the more, um, here even we should open another digression, but tendentially this seems to have been true for the cavalry and the infantry at the same time. Uh, albeit, uh, I think, that this is naturally true, mostly from, from, from what the, the cavalry was concerned. 
um, and it was naturally to, to it was natural to see a, a, a much a greater homogeneity between the the cheaper troops so tendentially the infantry between the, the two systems than, than between cavalrys right um, the, the the same Franks used of course as we've seen also in the, those videos on the Frankish recruitment in in Ottomar, the local militias local recruits and so on so those were essentially fighting in the same way the Muslims did if they weren't Muslims themselves actually um, so but about the William William of Tyre's uh, writes ex expressly when the first rank uh, talking about the Turks when the first rank had quite emptied their quivers and shot all their arrows the second in which there were still more horsemen came on and began to shoot more densely than one could believe the Turkish squadrons at once flung themselves upon our army and loosed such a quantity of arrows that you would have thought hail was falling from the air hardly had the first cloud of them fallen describing an arc that it was followed by a second no less dance right this is very very interesting in my opinion because aside from the most obvious intensity the rate of fire and so on what is fascinating is the the, the two waves right and especially the fact the fact that the first one was uh, the second one was larger than the second right uh, this is important because it um, it has, according to me, mainly a psychological effect, right? Naturally, this also depended on, on the specific circumstance or whatever the, uh, the Islamic commanders at that point had planned for that specific engagement. But the idea that you, you start being, you know, think about units in, in terms of their order and their cohesion, their, um, their lining, their, uh, you know, the, their combat readiness, let's say. The fact that you start harassing them for, for a while with a certain line of troops that already causes some problems and, uh, and it starts exasperating them, right? Because it's not even about the damage of arrows, as we will see in a while. That doesn't seem to have been utterly dramatic. Of course, actually, it was telling the truth, but it was more from a psychological point of view, right? And when you say, oh, wow, the first line has exhausted the arrows, now maybe the 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 intensity will be lowered no you you see that the second wave has uh, is is throwing even more arrows and these are falling um on an already uh you know worn out this array transformation right makes a, gives makes a lot of uh, of difference because it's not a matter of how many wounds you have caused but how much these guys are freaking out how much they are nervous and angry and frustrated at the fact that by the way, they can't pursue them because if they try to do it, at least even more groups, these guys are retreating and and still shooting uh, in famous party and shot fashion. That you know, even when they're retreating. So um, the Turks naturally were masters in this because they brought from some of them came straight from this time. To, you know, of course, the leaders had mostly settled and were already this uh, highly persified. Um, uh, leaders that had lived in civilization from a while but many of their mercenaries especially the bulk of these came straight from Central Asia even at this point um, so um, that's what those people there did in a lifetime they, they literally spent their lifetime on horseback right even more of course than uh, Western Knights did, that were conceived of na naturally also in a different fashion and um, the high rate of fire that we have seen here could be maintained. Uh, in fact, that um, Ambrose um, reported of uh, Richard's advance to Arsuf in 1191 that there was not as much as four feet of ground to be found that was entirely free of spent arrows. Right, and to maintain such a withering rate of fire, you have naturally to ensure enough ammunition. Right, and that's a that's a complicated thing to do logistically speaking. Um, there was an enormous preparation from the Muslims. You see this great effort that uh, also proves the, the complete awareness that, that the Muslims had, right, uh, in, of what the, the effect would have been on, on the Westerners. It's been estimated that each 
Turk, uh, Turkish horse archer, carried at least one and often two or three quivers, each capable of containing up to 60 arrows. So it means that theoretically, albeit, you know, average was surely lower, um, uh, one of these horse archers could have, could spend 180 arrows in a day. Which is a freaking lot, right? Especially considering also the capabilities of these bows and then and these, um, you know, the marksmanship of this. These people that trained, as we have seen, their, their role lives in these games, but also th this was truer also for for sedentary societies, right? This was uh, even in the West actually there was an archery tradition that w was somewhat normal for the times being, and we tend to forget. Um, despite, as you know, the crossbow was developing dramatically. Just think about the fact that we often say, you know, the crossbow was mostly something that, that Westerners got from the East together with trebuchet. Or, yeah, but, you know, would it actually use crossbow en masse, if not just exclusively at this point? And would it remain with mostly horse archers? And for which reason, right, this is, it, it's obvious that the answer cannot be technologistic. It can be mechanistic, right? This is very important to stress. Um, now, other arrows considered could be carried in the bow case, stuffed in, even into boots or, or the belt and so on, right? So imagine even the, the, the awkward appearance of, of, certain, uh, of certain fighters, generally speaking, but that, that proves actually their effectiveness in, in many ways. Um, and we know of relatively a few directly about the replenishment of empty, qui uh, empty quivers during... Uh, during during the battle that as you know could last even for for one day or more um we know about the battle of hatton that we have analyzed and in that that's that that's an excellent example perhaps the best we have seen perhaps the best in absolute terms and the best at least we have seen this time it's like a three hours video about the battle and in there saladin we have news that had 70 camels laden with arrows, or, as well as 400 loads of spare ammunition for them, right? I think since the time of Karai. Ah, yes, I remember what was the battle, in fact, it was remaining for, for the Battle of Aran, it was fought very close to where the Romans had been defeated by the Parthians, but that already at the time had all these spare, you know, uh, Surena had all these um, camels loaded with, with arrows to, you know, to block, have their, they had knocked out uh, the Gallic cavalry of the Romans. Uh, in an ambush, and it had pin started pinning down the legionnaires with like that, right? Uh, with uh, the same tactics, right? Over the millennia, it's basically the same thing. F simple and effective in many ways, but it also requires a planning. It's not about the mere fact that you have that weapon. Banally, ammo <laughs> makes a lot of difference, and it's all very gradual, very progressive. As we were saying, Battles went on for entire days. So, actually, just as in in, in on Western battlefields, we have to think of a lot of skirmishing. Um, sometimes, maybe the, the Middle Ages are not mostly remembered for this, but the idea, after all, that between a charge and another was still a lot of time to spend. Well, we think that was also this exchange of missiles. That, after all, as we've seen in the case of the crossbow, was 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 becoming um, in you know paradigmatic for Western battlefields and also ever more in um, in a in an ever more integrated fashion with cavalry, right? And actually, the connection between crossbows and cavalry, also in in in, in terms of uh, in antagonistic terms, is uh, a major uh, uh, is a major characteristic of Western warfare that is emerging at this point. Also, the Saracens use crossbows, of course. Um, mostly, we have associated associate them to the militias of the, the various, mostly the, the cities, the urban centers, not extremely different from Europe, but still in a seemingly in a more contained measure. Also it is for political social reasons that we they are connected, for example, with this idea of the ghulams, of these slaves that were constantly coming to fill the ranks of, of the Muslim leaders' armies rather than arming the local population. So you understand that even here the strictly technological element is literally one of the least important, right? You can even have an excellent bow, being an excellent marksman. If you don't have enough arrows, you can't. <laughs> you can't. It's, it's it's stupid at that, right? It's simple as that. Say better, right? It's probably the point. Um, we know 
uh, one of the Frankish dead at Agar Sanguinis in 1119 had as many as 40 arrows in him. Right. We may we mean in here that, as we will see now, that um, actually these arrows. I mean, most of them hadn't been not not just non-mortal, but they all had probably not even probably wounded the guy. Right. Um, Ibn al Kalnizi reports of the same battle that there were dead horses bristling like like hedgehogs, while the arrows sticking out of them. This is cruder, also because most uh, horses, as far as we understand, didn't have armor, if not padded armor. That is not dramatically represented, but it's way cheaper and dramatically effective. Like padded armor can actually do miracles, and there is, uh, it's enormously convenient. And um, you know that even about this, we're, we're not so likely documented. Well, first of all, because padded armor actually uh, melts away, like all organic uh, mat material most of the time. So we mostly get just the, the armor parts. Um, the idea, even this, uh, is controversial. Like we we don't know by which extent um, metal armor was used. Um, actually at this time, right? It's obvious that it starts becoming more frequent for the elite by the, essentially the 13th century, late 13th century, beyond. But we have even as for certain chroniclers about, you know, previous times, right? Byzantine sources tell that by the 11th century, for example, Hungarian knights had probably breastplates, something like that. That's not very important, but let's say that horses, at least for what we're concerned now, but horses naturally were the m the m most vulnerable between the knight that had usually the best protection possible, and um, in fact the mount. And consider also another point is that usually before the 16th century, where basically the the jowls produced by you know uh, of of energy produced in a in a in an arquebus shot start rendering every armor obsolete whatever you know the, at least every any best armor that existed at the time was virtually projectile proof right what existed at the time was was effect as effective as it could be right so there is not a prevalence of a weapon that becomes incredibly you know even about the crossbows there are all these tales of multiple several people being pierced through it and, we can imagine, of course, of for example, an enormous range of types, of typologies, of sizes, etc. This was all an artisanal world, right? Everything was unique um, as a single piece. But generally speaking, as these cases prove, actually, we have lot, fairly lot of evidence of troops being constantly hit by these arrows and continuing to, to fight which means that they weren't even at least mortal uh, to a certain point, maybe they all together they they could make bleed you out for tens of hours if they really hit your your, your flesh, cause lots of other shocks and you know damage that you know uh, the human organism is actually very delicate and easily compromisable. And may it might have been easier to, to die of exhaustion rather or or, or uh, of a heat uh, uh, of heat rather than, than uh, of arrows, right? Um, we know by the 13th century that at El Mansura, Joanville thought himself from his work um, when he writes this, and his horse fortunate to have been wounded by arrows only five and fifteen times respectively, right? This is interesting. Also, naturally, the horse is a pretty large beast, and these were war horses, so were usually larger than the usual, especially the stallions. But the um, even though that they weren't proper, you know, the idea that the, the knight was always uh, on on the big mount is um, is not very correct. It mostly, perhaps, and especially during crusades, for all the reasons we have mentioned. That, but also in Europe, the the runner would be um, the, the average mount of, of knights, right? Also, we, for example, we don't understand much about the actual segmentation of the various cavalry um, 
elements, right? You know, we know we, we sources speak of milites, and we they mean knights altogether. But you know, what was the segmentation there of the knight, of the of the squire, of other retainers, right, and or sergeants, and all this stuff, and how were they kept, and how were they were categorically kept, right? There is no certainty, and there was probably a, a large degree of, um, let's say, even of course of, of you know of, of 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 differences, but also possibly of homogenization in this sense as well. At least you know the the troops that did similar things from a tactical point of view tended to be equipped similarly and in fact the general tendency towards the 13th century is that squires were becoming uh, this is easily easily seen in the west like kind of identical to knights as as fighting men in terms of equipment and of skills right at least from a in terms of training not necessarily of experience as you understand but uh, that's also to be taken into consideration. Regarding the effectiveness, in fact, of Turkish archery, we have to think that during... we have a number here, an interesting number from the Siege of Tyre in 1111, right? It's a siege that lasted four months and a half. The Franks lost only 2,000 men, which is not a few, actually, according to Ibn al-Kalanisi, despite the fact that he reports the Islamic garrison, which was admittedly far from exclusively Turkish in composition, to have discharged 20,000 Arabs in one day's fighting alone. Right. That's a lot, actually. I, I even doubt that if, uh, it is... Uh, I don't know here if it was like a, a sortie or something, but 20,000 Arabs requires... Well, of course, yes, it can be achieved, actually, in, in a even uh, by the right numbers, even in like 20 minutes, actually. Um, but that tells you probably what we are seeing before, that also there is no proper evidence of armor, of the finest armor being pierced, or better, these, these guys, of someone being killed, even though he was wearing armor, right, by a single arrow, right? This is very rare, right? It's, it's, it's a challenge, right? It probably exists somewhere... Most of the stories here, you know, there are authors that are more or less credible and for someone to talk about special effects, even if from manuscript illuminations, sometimes you see things that we know actually are not true from our, our experimental archaeology. Um, they're just poetical uh, license in some ways, but uh, it's, it's realistic that at least the elite of Crusaders' armies w would be relatively... Um, you know, uh, at least for what the, the knights were concerned, not necessarily the horses, but generally speaking, they were very well, very well, almost completely projectile proof, right? And generally speaking, also for what concerns the horses, um, like at this time, nor in the east nor in the west, you ever find an army of, of uh, or units or of entirely missile troops that are able to stop the sheer mass of a not just of a cavalry charge charging unit but even just of single infantry right or properly of those troops that fought in thickly packed formations and that were the really the, the smashing force in the field that also is the, the the Muslims had of course so we should always consider missile weapons in here always secondary Right. What truly really matters is the cavalry charge and hand-hand fighting. In this regard, mostly, of course, the, the cavalry charge because that's probably what messes up the the, the cohesion and formations and so on. Um, and generally speaking, this broader maneuvers on the field of the various divisions supporting each other. Right. So the the, the single arrow, especially, is virtually ininfluent. Altogether, it starts make making a, an important difference, but it's not nearly the size of as such, and it was pretty much standard this time to be seen, right? You, you you knew that as soon as you went into combat, you know, arrows were starting to rain like hell. And you went through that. And uh, and uh, the, the armor, the, the, the training, it was designed exactly to, to, to cope with that, right? So it should also be, of course, the... Um, you know the 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 the, fan, I mean the, the fact that chroniclers 
our Western chronicles are impressed by this is because in the West there was no missile, let's say volume of fire of that kind, right? So it was something unusual. But at the same time, we went there and fought there, knew that, and it was kind of fine at the end of the day. Um, it should be borne in mind that Turkish arrows were also relatively light, right? Usually, at least, they could um, they could strike and perhaps even penetrate armor, right? Um, and even simple kilted armor without actually wounding the wearer, right? Largely. At Arsuf, for example, Frankish infantry are recorded by Beda had been marching along unconcernedly with up to 10 arrows stuck in their armor. Right? Though the cause for this was often that the arrows were too light and shot at too great a range. That is also particularly important. There are several sources that, s that refer up the quote, astonishing range from which Turks sometimes open fire. Right, and th this this is true because composite bows have actually a pretty long um, range, but effective range in, in a real battle is something else, right? Mm, th certain experiments brought even to like f more than 400 meters, as always, like the crossbow, the long roll, this. And it, th that makes you realize also how relatively symmetric the world thing really was, but it's obvious that, you know, you know, if you didn't close to at least 100 meters, uh, the penetrative value of, of the arrow was was very, you know, it could be spent, right? In part, as we've seen, it was mostly a psychological thing, because whatever things are starting to pour from the sky, you, f you freak out, and that's essentially, as moral forces are prevalent, the most important thing at the end of the day. So the reasons and the, you know, measure to which these shots also were carried out um, corresponded also always to that dynamic. It's not about the physical, mechanical one, not necessarily, right? It's not all about that. Most of the times it's what effect you want to achieve on the enemy, right? Um, and of course, the sources imply what, you know, what physics teach us that uh, at a closer range there, uh, the, the arrows became far more effective. Anna Komnena, for example, records that the arrows could pass clean through an unarmored man she she said a bit of uh, um, fantasy stuff sometimes especially when talking about the crossbow in, in certain cases always always bearing in mind as always that as we were saying before that the were like th these weapons were were not standard right and the, generally speaking you know the more powerful the machine was the more technically difficult it was to operate so there was a good enough standard that would have not brought the best weapon in the field, but just the one that, you know, fit rightly this compromise between effectiveness, between, I don't know, weight, loading time, and etc., and, and penetrative power, and the whole thing also depended for whichever range you needed to engage, or, and all this stuff. As we were saying, this type of archery was particularly effective against unarmored horses, big targets, from always, let's say, uh, best target for every missile trooper. The Turks knew something about horses, uh, obviously, and they they learned, of course, the, the, the important role that th these animals had in Frankish tactics, right? For example, writing on the Battle of Hatton, Abu Shama observes how the Frankish knight, um, quote, so long as his horse is safe and sound, cannot be felled. But as soon as the horse is killed, the knight is thrown down and captured. This is very important in many ways because it shows, first of all, the kind of an obvious thing that it's important to, to remind that there is no good cavalry if the, you know, the, the cavalryman is good and the horse is not, and vice versa. And these, these two animals, as as humans we are, together with horses. For are are best in combat when they formed that bound that only someone who intensely trains and and, and and especially knows a specific horse and of course this is you know there's plenty of evidence in this historically speaking you know can can really achieve right um, here there are also more practical 
reasons as, as it's understood. As of course if you take someone's horse down, which was considered a big deal, you know, that at least ideally, purely ideally, yeah, in my opinion, um, in, in Western warfare killing, uh, you know, a knight killed another knight's horse was considered a felon in many ways. Um, but uh, because cor horses, war horses costed a freaking law, right? Having a war horse and, and the full panoply if it was like, you know, uh, literally having a, like a, a private jet in terms of, of properly from in terms of social standards, right? You are, you are, th that costed an enormous law. There was a, enormous businesses related even in crusading state, uh, the Ottoman states about all the, the mounts, uh, you know, replacement and uh, compensation for damage, all, the, all this stuff. You know, the horse is actually extremely resilient as a beast, but it's also very, very fragile. You know, if it uh, get gets crippled, it's done for. You can't use it in combat anymore. So, just think about this hail of arrows targeting the horse, and think about yourself being, you know, on horse you can't, on horseback you can't move and run away. Right, and especially the enemies are, are fast, as we've seen. Uh, usually faster than you. And just think about fighting in certain circumstances under the, the Syrian sun in, in, in July and having, you know, maybe being exhausted by a march for days and having your horse shut down. Well, what, what Abu Shama is talking about here is that if you remain on foot, just get captured. You can't run away. With your armor, with your that is also maybe a you know a passport for for survival because as long as you are a, a knight, you can also be a ransom if you are a common militiaman. You know you just slaughter him. Who the hell cares about them? Uh, but the, um, uh, the there is properly that physically speaking, you can't make it. You can't make it. How how long do you think you can exist in that conditions? You can't come back. You know, will you know enemy horses swarming all around? It, it's impossible. Right, it, it often happens. I found it myself in Western fields. You know, many sources explained explicitly stating, you know, since their horses had been killed, you know, it was more convenient for the knights to surrender. It was a battle from 1332, studying that, um, and that's obvious in many ways. Especially, you know, as the the armor became heavier, that is also a factor over time. Imad ad Din records the heavy toll. The Turkish arrows took off the Franks' horses on the Battle of Hatton. Hardly any of the thousands that were present being left alive. Um, there was this practice in, well, you know, in Frankish, uh, especially in the Order of March, but also during the battle properly as a tactic. We have seen it. Um, if I not wrong about the third battle of Ram, like was explicitated, but you know, usually the fact that the infantry, if it didn't properly precede cavalry, but at least it sheltered it, right? A sort of a mobile fortress around the cavalry. This was expressly done to create a, a wall, as Beha puts it. The author Imad uses a similar expression, describing the Frankish army as a wall of arms, a bite. This has to do also with the thickly compact formation that usually speaking the Western armies had, right? The Turks, as we've seen, swarmed all around. It was very flexible, in properly not in a true formation, but all these smaller units. Of course, it could recompact, but were running back and forth. It's not about the lining up and so on. So, the only chance was being, you know, uh, compact, right? Even if that, you know, made you an easy target. But as we've seen, the the relative effectiveness of arrows was partly compensating that or at least the effectiveness of armor if you want to put it in that way while the Islamic heavier cavalry was observing from a far distance and, and you know deciding what would have been the best moment to intervene to uh, to fall on the worn out enemy. At Jaffa in 1191 Richard Lionard formed up his infantry with spearmen in the first rank shields to the front and spear butts braced against the ground with two crossbow armed men behind each man one loading one fire firing uh, uh, it was defined um, a wall of arms 
right? And on that occasion, the Turks refused to close on it. That's a very important um, witness of Western warfare, you know, the devil thing in this sense. This idea of uh, essentially closing all the, you know, fixing the spears on the ground and then closing, uh, bracing um, together with each other uh, to form this very thick um, spear wall and the and also shield wall for, for that matter but you know the, the importance of shield walls is, is kind of a uh, you know overlooked right shields are needed to, to protect from blows properly it's not that they make anything in terms of protecting you from from an from an impact of especially of cavalry right people are obsessed by shield walls without realizing actually shield walls are used primarily to protect yourself from 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 projectiles right it's not they are uh, kind of an a offensive defensive tactic by, by themselves what really makes the difference is if you have freaking point spears in front of you right and the other very important thing is the crossbowmen this were italian specifically peasants uh, crossbowmen this idea of the alternating lines of, of crossbow and one, one reloading it would be implemented, we know it from Italian warfare, especially in the 14th century, by the peasants in the same way. Um, and um, in the Battle of Montecatini in 1315, so it's a combined armed um, tactics that I'm studying, specifically at this point in my work, because it's uh, like it's difficult to properly reconstruct how th these troops were interacting practically on the field as units uh, where were they deployed right there are some hypotheses about that we haven't we haven't studied the battle of Jaffa but we will and we will maybe try to make some hypotheses there and this is also interesting because it uh, you know you would say well these guys were shooting all the time this is what seemingly what was important, you know, having two these two lines, one reloading and the other the other firing. This is important because especially with that psychological side that we were talking about before. So that it's not about much, you know, you could have an entire line of so you know, enough room for these guys to or not complication to to simply fire at will, right? Instead there is this properly you know, constant fire it wants to be achieved, evidently for that reason, uh, and that is aimed evidently at coping with the constant fire of the Turks as well, right? And that proves, by the way, in this context, that's definitely so uh, a very high level of you know of, of, of um, rate of fire, even not just all the, the collectively, well, the enemy troops all together properly from the single horse archer that speaks about the effectiveness of of crossbows. In general, and um, that you know, the, the comparison between horse archery, longbowmen, uh, you know, and crossbowmen is is very, you know, if it gets down to the performance of the single piece of the single weapon, it's it's not a military historical analysis, right? And um, and this should be understood as such that of course that there was something that made a difference even in that sense, but it's hardly decisive right and it's mostly about this combined arms this great cohesion moral forces whatever the the preparation of the troops are uh, the troop is right so it's not about the technological thing once again a similar tactic basically it's almost identical was used by Louis IX's infantry whilst holding the beach head at Damietta in 1249, famously, right? It was the French crusaders landed in Egypt. Uh, it was this heroic landing in, in the water proper, in uh, close to, to 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 the shore, under under the, the Egyptian fire. But um, and people say, you know, what the, the Franks were on the defensive, though. Yes, they were on the defensive because properly, in this sense, we're trying to naturally to to, to progress through but um, in I ideally you also from we can say from a strategical point of view but naturally at the moment the best thing if you are under this uh, hell of fire the best thing is to remain under cover to maintain cohesion not to lose uh, nerves and to respond with with fire 
same time. So we can presume even here that yeah, maybe there was an increase of missile power in crusading armies towards the end. It was an improvement, but generally speaking, we, we can't attribute it much in, in, in these terms, like in, in, in you know, in relation to to, to, this, to a greater Islamic firepower. Right? It can be true, but also it depends on the on the intensity of the shot. Usually, crossbows are thought to be to have more to deliver more energy, but um, it's it's all balanced on the base of how armored your troops, generally speaking, are. Of, of, you know what kind of resistance you can put to that. So properly throughout all crusade during the crusades, but we can't think of a dramatic imbalance or a dramatic change in the also missile uh, capabilities of of the boat contendants, right? And once again, properly they they probably balanced each other pretty pretty easily. Uh, more usually, the, uh, the, the the troops seem to have formed up in line, in a relatively close order, probably several ranks deep. Those armed with bows and crossbows, constituting actually a large amount of Frankish infantry, usually to the fore, so that they could return the fire of the Turks, who soon learned a healthy respect for the crossbow in particular. Um, the this might have even triggered in the Turkish armies the necessity to remain at, at a distance, right? So, you know, limiting to to an optimal the the even the, the penetrating effect of, of of arrows against enemy enemy arrow for the sake of their own security. But as we are seeing right now, this was pro properly already existing since since the beginning, right? Um, did Frankish armies in Ultramar have more missile troops than in the West. This is difficult to say, actually. Um, tendentially would seem so, but uh, I don't have specific proof of this, right? It's very difficult to, to calculate in the first place. Surely they, made a, they might have had uh, a, a way, a greater access to troops that knew how to shoot in the same way the Turks did. Because basically, that was a local tradition since millennia, right? Think about the Assyrian bow, right? You know, they, they were specialists, as we've seen. The video about the Maronites of Syria were appreciated exactly for this. William of Tyre, in his account of the Battle of Mari as Safar in 1126, credits Frankish infantry, presumably archers, right, with the same tactic. Um, as the Turks, in that they turned their attention to wounding the horses of their adversaries and thus rendered their riders easy victims to the Christians. That is, the, the knights who were following, right? This is interesting because, um, first of all, in the same account, the, the, the source gives a good description of the royal infantry in close combat, relating how, quote, they instantly dispatched with a sword any wounded or fallen infidel from the... Uh, whom they cha chanced to find and thus prevented all possibility to escape, they lifted up those of their own cavalry who had been thrown down and restored them to the fray. They sent the wounded back to the baggage train to receive care. Right. Um, so at the same battle, there is uh, even evidence of Turkish infantry in action. Fulker of Shah de describes Damascen infantry trained, quote, to spring up men behind the horse, men who when the enemy drew near, descended and fought on foot. For so they hoped to disorder the Franks by attacking them with infantry on the alone side and cavalry on the other. On the one side and cavalry on the other. Right? This is particularly interesting because um, it, it speaks of combined arms, combined tactics properly because they're, they're even detached. Right? So it's not just the evidence of infantry following cavalry. Right, that is was presumably a much more frequent tactics. Sometimes we're talking about smaller, you know, infantry had naturally its own units and formation, and would have to stay very compact in all of this, and also to provide the the Frankish cavalry like with a mobile shield and, uh, but you know, uh, a mobile fortress that, however, had to stand its ground, while these guys retreated behind their ranks, and they had to, in fact, 
to cope with Turkish charges and, and assaults and so on. But th there is, and this is witnessed also in Europe and in many other contexts, historically speaking, um, properly of single um, light troops are actually supporting close range on foot the cavalry. And even, you know, trying, for example, to, to disembowel the enemy horses, well, you know, with knives um, running under them, all this stuff. So it's actually pretty, um, pretty common. Here we have properly the description of an infantry that supports uh, in the melee, right? You know, it supports the same knights, take, brings them away. This is what something also that the squires were actually trained to do um, in the same form. So uh, we have to think that many retainers and the same squires, since all horses were also, you know, uh, uh, a rare commodity in certain situations, could actually this dismount and fight as infantry. This is this happened often in, in the Western warfare at some level, especially uh, before the thirteenth century was pretty common. Right. Uh, after that infantry started to become more numerous. It's literally even in there a matter of political and social balance. There were more people from those classes and so on. That those were exploited even in a technically in a more offensive way. The spread of crossbow went went in parallel with that. Right. Um, we can think that the Turkish horses were even more vulnerable on average than the Christian ones because the, the Christian ones having on average more armor, we can presume, even if it was still something rare as we've seen so, but it, I mean, it's, it was, on average, was probably easier to knock out with the same weapon, same um, missile. The, um, a Turkish horse as a light or so, you know, um, weaker beast, like, you know, uh, maybe more resilient in terms of, uh, you know, it's not that they couldn't take uh, arrows, but I mean, take down a stallion surely takes more, right? These horses realized the thing, they were trained to, to feel pain in part as well, so th these were dramatic realities, which horses perfectly understand what's going on in that regard. Um, they they know at least they have to carry on, right? So this is a very dramatic picture, after all. But in speaking of the uh, second major tactical advantage of the Turks over the Franks, mobility, right? Um, there is to say that, of course, uh, hit and run skirmishing tactics were as we were saying before, not much of a problem in the sense that the Franks couldn't charge them or reach the, the enemy horses. But properly, that they would do that, sacrificing, you know, a charge, which is a very complex and demanding thing to do for troops that were not of the same level. This is the problem also of, of this whole thing. That, of course, you usually don't set forth, you don't charge if there is just kind of horse archers, there are light cavalry in front of you. Yes, they can run away, but it's probably not much that, right? You can't even reach them. The problem is how much resources you spend. Um, at the same time, for, 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 a, for a cavalry charge, it could be more effectively employed against a, you know, harder and, you know, in this sense also more important objective that uh, that is out there waiting, especially towards the end of the battle. Right, there is this thing that uh, naturally, if there is some wearing out, uh, typically there is from the Turkish side, on the and the Christians, the the heavier Turkish forces are in the rear. This is um, it's not really the same exactly the same thing in um, for for the Christians, but it's, it also depends. Right, it were this this heavier lighter cavalry was often more mixed even than than we think. The point, though, is that you can't remain also, if you want to spare your forces or a charge, constantly under arrow fire, because that is wearing out, so your your mounts, etc. So, aside from the fact that you have to keep them in, in a position for which they're relatively safe from, from enemy fire, you have to have someone in, in between, like infantry, as we've seen. So, this even prevents your deployability at a certain level, um, and there is all uh, a balance in this sense it must be kept also by other troops that are relatively less reliable like the infantry 
uh, so it's all a, a very precarious balance, right? And and the main point about the crisis is not about running after the enemy. I, it, this is not the point. You could even, of course, if this guy's retreated, you, you could do it, but it was not mainly that the problem. The problem was the, the resources that you spent, even if you could easily reach them, right? As we were saying before, this is not a matter of a single horseman chasing another horseman. So they're entire units. The larger units are, the slower th they are, they, the more, okay, let's say, homogeneously engageable they are um, in this regard. So, uh, the as we were saying before, the horse archery, this is the mobility proper of, of the Turkish armies, this element of the Turkish armies, was mostly employed during the march of the Franks, showering their columns with, with projectiles throughout all the way, right? This is exemplified by many battles. We have seen it at Manzikert, we have seen it at Hampton. Franks were used to this. And actually, from a strictly military logical point of view, they had no real option but to press re resolutely on. Actually, even to accelerate, if possible, if that didn't tire them enough, because as you know, you know, you know one thing, if you do too much, uh, uh, in, a, in a certain moment you, you exhaust yourself in proportion more even for what you could have continued to do if you did it uh, did the same effort in a, in a more diluted time so these marches as we've seen could be hellish in terrible conditions heat thirst fires uh, light up th to smoke the enemy and these freaking arrows that uh, I can't stress this enough. It's not about the damage, but it, they, they drive you nuts because they're falling all the freaking time. And of course, every once in a while, they also hurt, right? So it's not something you can't simply learn to accept. Well, okay, uh, I, I don't really mind, right? You can't get used to that, but you're still consuming resources of anxiety, adrenaline, but burning your, your energy. So it's actually a, a serious problem. And, and the Turks, as we have seen, didn't have much means to, to break through the Frankish lines most of the times without this softening up, right? As we were saying before, the infantry was usually deployed uh, during the march in the outer part of the formation, right? Albeit still from a strictly tactical point of view, if someone attacked the, you know, the, the column, usually as you know, the, this, these columns were split like in the battle in different, uh, in different units. These divisions, broadly speaking, and sometimes the, the, you know, the Turks were always kind of testing the enemy's, um, the, the enemy's uh, cohesion in that sense. Because of course, in, in column, you're ready for combat. In your your equip, the 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 for the column formation is also naturally thought to redeploy at some point. But it's not as if you were lined up for meeting an enemy that you know is going to attack you from from that direction. So the very often in in all of this, the, the heavier Turkish forces were concealed so that you didn't properly. You, you you knew perfectly that they were there out somewhere, but you couldn't properly realize with all the dust and the confusion when they would arrive. So even before then the arrows, like you, you saw this this horse is coming. Think about the smoke, the dust, you, you don't you can't really understand what's going on. If, if, is this the main enemy one of the main enemy divisions is attacking somewhere else? And the Turks played psychologically and also, you know, physically, materially in this, by of course intensifying the the assault were wherever they saw that it was more disarray and at that point that part of the column had to stop we've seen it at Hatton right the distance itself this was dangerous because naturally uh, this split forces and uh, you know it was a race against time uh, there were this smaller com you know combats that were uh, started along the way cavalry needed to be employed in some ways but as we've seen being surrounded by infantry also it had time to deploy it was a complicated thing right and a very serious problem so it, most of the, the world softening up also contemplated this um, usually the Turks pressed on the uh, on the rear guard 
right? The Dark Guard, as we will see in a while, had to ban be manned by freaking amazing people because that's always like you, when you want to have your elite in um, that and on the front, of course. Because naturally, wherever this army was coming from, if you attack it from the rear, you cut its supply lines or at least it, its retreat. Um, and at that point, they, it's very important to say, even just psychological, okay, the cut off the, our retreat, what the hell do we know now? Right? This is a desperate situation. Um, the, um, the, the strategic objective, if you think about hunting, was all about reaching the other side. So this could vary as well, but still psychologically speaking, it's not like you, even just nosiologically, I mean, you, you know what, with the way you have gone through, right? So technically you feel confident about, you know, your brain revolves around to, okay, if I have to retreat, I have to come back there rather than going ahead because I don't know what's there. Um, sometimes it would be the other way around, right? But generally speaking, cut, cutting your, your, your rear guard is, is, is dramatic. Um, and they, the Turks uh, took all precautions in this regard. They usually conformed their own pace to that of the infantry, the enemy infantry, so that um, this would m mean to, to simply target them continuously at a good uh, rate. In all of this, it was very important to maintain cohesion, order, not to freak out. Right. Uh, it was important for cavalry and infantry that sometimes were stationed also, you know, cavalry was, wasn't was always framed under, especially the, the vanguard, the rear guard, they, they always had infantry, but, you know, they were generally think, thought to be more readily deployable in some way, so it could happen that cavalry pressed on and infantry remained behind. It was very risky, for actually for both of them, um, in, in, the world, in, in the single division, and that was to be avoided naturally. Uh, it was an important thing that infantry and cavalry would march at the same speed. Um, and another point is that in, in this world confusion, the same Turks actually didn't clearly understand completely what was going on. As we were saying, these columns could stretch for kilometers sometimes in the march. So um, actually uh, an important indicator was the amount of people left behind, right? Uh, dead, wounded, but also people said we were exhausted and simply would also desert. It often happened as well. We've seen it at Hatton, same time. And this indicator was trying to be concealed by the Crusaders, would sometimes would even carry their own dead on camels and pack horses as they marched so that they wouldn't show uh, the the actual number of casualties to the enemy, right? The thing was difficult to measure at a strictly, you know, uh, small tactical level, right? But it was mostly a game of, of the world divisions, how they were progressing. As we have seen, the Turks concentrated preferably on their air guard when attacking the Frankish columns. Uh, sometimes with their own entire divisions. Um, and the hope was to um, slow down, slow them down sufficiently to cause a gap between it and the main body, right? It wasn't even about crushing them appropriately, you know, creating this confusion between the wall, the wall, the wall column, and um, cutting uh, the communication between all parts so that they, they could also, in terms of command, take different decisions that you know, would be uh, this, you know, disagreeing with each other. So. Um, for example, th this happened in Mount Cadmus in 1148, also at Aten in 1187. We don't fully understand what happened, but surely at some point the Crusaders, you know, some pushed through, as we will see now in a while, others, you know, came back, right? So it, was a, it wasn't even such an enormously disastrous thing as it's usually believed. But properly, the lack of cohesion made the, the thing lost and the world eventually political and strategical consequences of victory are, are, are widely renowned. Um, another tactic was naturally to, to attack the vanguard to hope, uh, ho hoping to, to stop the wall column, right? Um, so that the, the, they, they wouldn't progress. Um, there would be um, small controlled charges uh, against the Franks to provoke them, right? To show them the you know, the heavier troops, so that the Franks said, that, that's it, if you charge these, we charge uh, the bulk of their troops, and the, the, the mass of the court, uh, 
critical corridor trip so we should charge and this was often a trick sometimes naturally size matters in, in this regards um, but as we've seen it was difficult to even see what was happening altogether on the field to fully realize it um, uh, Abu Shama writes that the Franks could be carried away by blind, blind fury right it was a stereotypical in some ways but it was also a matter of you know it was a lot of competition between the the various leaders in many occasions but that was still part of a broader logic that should be properly understood um, not, not just a stereotypical you know loss of temper of course losing nerves and uh, you know um, you know just charging to, to to free themselves from anxiety it's a real thing ask you know where were the first veterans you know in the trenches you know they preferred the, the attack rather than the wait on it this is exactly the same thing right and Shama writes that, that this would bring them to attack um, so that they would give us that the Muslims the opportunity to divide and break their mass so this much naturally down to 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 increase the their disorganization because carrying out a cavalry charge is not something you can repeat endless times right the first two three four etc but uh, at some point you will be simply exhausted and of no use and still you know you have to, to reorganize all the troops it, it becomes exhausting you can't do it especially in certain situations more than, than multiple times um, concentrated archery could um, also cause the same same effect that is to say you know the more troops are targeting you at a single moment it's because the, the more they are massed in front of you so you can think to to charge in them and knock out like yeah they're, they're the light cavalry but still there they are many so that we charge them even with, with a few uh, heavy knights we can kill lots of them uh, this happened for example at Arsufin 1191 right and timing was essential in this because technically every option could be good right the the balance of the battle could be shifted at some point that nobody really knew which uh, which was so it was a matter of reconnaissance a matter of eye of intuition of coup d'oeil as von Clausewitz would call it right and um, you know you must had iron steel nerves to do that Richard Lionheart was great at this point because it was not about the courage stereotypically that was surely needed but properly this this intelligence to realize when the the, the attack had to be launched and with lots of noblemen that actually didn't want to obey to you because even if you were a king maybe they thought you were more or less just a primus inter pares not really a sovereign to take uh, orders from and there was all this this prestige that was part of the same military logic of chivalry that had to bring naturally the same leader to, to charge it, give the example, and this, give this tremendous boost, but it could be sometimes ill-advised, right? So, um, the, and this uh, units could start doing them alone. So it was a dramatic situation. It was in many ways all this time this calcula endless calculation that uh, at some point, however, had to, to make the, the battle done in a way or another. Even waiting too much could be detrimental. In fact, um, the Franks learned, but probably already knew uh, since the beginning pretty well how to control their counterattacks in this situation. Of course, in Europe, they mostly clashed against troops that, you know, frontally speaking, wanted to engage. This was a different situation, but the, the way of how to achieve it actually was pretty clear, even to someone who had never seen this before. Uh, all the knights knew how fast their, uh, you know, the, the things could could have uh, developed right so it wasn't a matter of getting accustomed to the new tactics but simply you know accustoming your your mind to to, to the right timing which is a different thing um, uh, knights could also charge out uh, and na naturally this happened not just in a in a wall line but maybe in pockets to to drive the enemy away to a safe distance if it came too close for example and this was naturally carried out support with uh, your own missile troops, Frankish missile troops, with infantry. Um, uh, this could could happen naturally before rallying and falling back to the main column as well, right? Without distancing too much also from the bulk of the dual army. But usually divisions also operated in fair autonomy in this sense. They were kind of a 
different armies on their own, or at least, you know, the the the, the plan, the, the the communication was, generally speaking, in in theory, still during the battle. Um, the author of the Itinerarium likens this to beating off a fly, which, though you may drive it off, will return directly. You seize your force, and that's exactly that unnerving thing psychological effect that we were talking about before. Although Duya, that participated to Louis the Seventh's crusade, the shame of Damascus, in 1147-49, gives a good description of the organization of the Franks uh, during the march, right, with uh, in their column, given this explanation, says, quote, because the Turks were quick to flee, our men were commanded to endure until they received an order the attacks of their enemies, and to withdraw forthwith when recalled. When they had learned this, the, they were also told the order of march so that a person in front would not rush to the rear and the guards of the flanks would not fall into disorder. Moreover, those whom nature of fortune had made foot soldiers were drawn up at the rear in order to oppose with their bows the enemy's arrows. Right. This is interesting because um, there were properly many knights, even among the infantry, that had this role of uh, NCOs or officers, like saying, you know, how you know, to, to tell them the militias, the infantry, you know, how to be disciplined, how to. This was very important in perspective, and the synergy between the various arms was catalyzed uh, over time, thanks to, to these individuals uh, as well. Right, so here it's important to maintain cohesion, to maintain the post, right? It's kind of pretty universal, right? And there were severe penalties also for any man who broke the ranks. In this sense, we have examples of battles fought on the march, such as Hab 1119, Mount Cadmus 1148, Hatton 1187, and Ersuf 1191, that show how essentially that... Um, asymmetry in the sense of a bulkier Frankish for bulkier but slower Frankish forces were uh, peppered, like targeted continuously by the, 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 the Turks that didn't have enough shock power to break the enemy ranks uh, at the beginning of the battle um, would, would would wait in fact for for, for the same to to, head, to to launch the the main assault at at the end while so they would remain at a distance throughout the whole thing. This happened, for example, in the Battle of Manzikert, right? And naturally, the way the, the troops were deployed in here for uh, around the column were ch changed, right? Panic. Some some of these were properly ambushes. Others were, you know, uh, properly major battles for which the you know the Christians perfectly knew also what what was going to happen after all. And uh, the situation was fairly clear, and it would get through that anyway because the strategic conditions we've seen it had in obliged them, in some ways or at least once that the decision was taken, it was a fairly good reason for doing it. After all, you know, uh, there is always this criticism that whoever loses is just an idiot that made took made the wrong decision. But actually, the, this this is dramatically arrogant to say. You know, you think you would actually do better than a crusader commander of the 12th century, uh, if you had been there, right? It, it's not likely, right? And this also dramatically overlooks luck as a factor um, in every single military action for which nobody knows how battles will, will end, right? It's, 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 uh, otherwise, they wouldn't even be fought, right? But aside from this, because of their military prowess, the contingents of the military orders usually held the dangerous stations of vanguard and rearguard on the march. These were the elite of the Crusader State's army. So, um, as we were saying before, that's where you want your elite. Because they can understand better right, what the wall situation is. The center was usually composed by the largest forces, where usually the main commander was the main supplies and symbols and, and trophies and all this stuff stay which is also more repaired right the vanguard and and, and the rear guard are naturally the, the also the most dangerous areas but if you entrust them to 
to the elite, they will not be reliable in this sense, not to, you know, the snake not to lose the hand of the tail, but properly. Uh, also, they will be able to, to take the best decision, right? Because the elite is valid also for what concerns the command. As people rose to the ranks, the, the military orders had this first reputation of for um, you know for reliability in fact and devotion to the cause they also made their their mistakes as as anybody but generally speaking they they were those um, they were also for a matter of mobility you know, think about the battle of Hatton, right they basically made it true right at least the, the rear guard made it true as far as we know we, we don't have much knowledge of it but I think it did they in fact we know that most of their components eventually showed up later in other circumstances, so they made it through, right? They properly broke through the enemy, because this was also the, th the thing, that the Turkish ranks were not as hard as the, um, as the Christian ones. They would retreat, hopefully, so, um, uh, to an attack, so you, you could theoretically shoot them away and pass through them, right? This is what happened with the the Christian vanguard that Hatton that made it through safely eventually. Jacques de Vitry relates how the Franks fought not rash how uh, excuse me the military orders fought not rashly or disorderly but wisely and with with caution, right? Being the first to attack and the, the last to retreat, they were not allowed to turn their backs and flee, nor to retreat without orders. But, as we were saying, the, in reality, of course, even the, the Knights of the Military Orders could be as willful and headstrong as their secular counterparts, right? And there are examples of the Templars, for example, at Maria Yun in 1171, at Carson in 1187, we made a bit about that battle, and at El Mansura in 1250. And also of the Hospitaliers at their Suf, um, having this kind of, uh, you know, uh, after all, they were conceptually the same thing, right? They were just more fanatically trained from an ideological point of view in a kind of almost suicidal sense. And this partly also helped the, the reason why they, they were conceived to, to stand their ground against uh, swarms of enemies, right? But they were still normal people, like everybody. You know, they were just a part of, homogeneously part of the military elite, and they were as good individually especially as, as, as uh, you know, uh, the average knight um, however and it should be considered in this regard in fact that the it was in all these cases mostly fault of their grand master's decisions right uh, for what the Templars are concerned the hospitaliers that are so f following, following the example of their marshal right so there was properly more collective training, more, more discipline among these these orders, and it's just about their, their leaders being no different. After all, I've even in here from from the other aristocrats in some ways, and having their good reason after all. And never think that when these units, especially, launched a charge, doesn't matter how many the enemies were, they were just like necessarily miscalculating the thing. Because there might have not been a way to calculate that, and the strategic situation would force them to take the risk. So actually, these are not nonsensical, suicidal uh, choices. Um, they, are, they were always concretely thought, and um, and they they were always aimed at something that could objectively turn out to be successful, practical in general. Right? It can be practical also to to get yourself killed if what you care about is the strategical consequence of having, I don't know, taken out in the process lots of enemies, enough enemies for uh, achieving that strategic objective, right? So it really depends. Most of the times we are simply not documented enough to know whatever the, the balance really, really was at that point. Um, also, one cartulary of the 13th century states that it was customary for the orders to hold the vanguard and rearguard positions, right? And Sultan Mamluk Sultan Baybars, uh, 
once marched uh, with captured Hospitaller and Templar banners in the van in order to fool the Franks for this very reason. Here we are in later times and in which uh, the Templars especially had um, created very sophisticated, actually they, they had pioneered in part some of, it's possible that it happened in uh, in the environment of the Crusades and partly was exported also in Western Europe, but uh, the some of the most sophisticated uh, feudal warfare uh, prescriptions were uh, written down by, by the Templars. We, the, the Templar statutes are of, of dramatic importance, very underestimated as a source. Sometimes we'll, we will have to, to give a look at that as well. Examples of the practice um, are found in uh, the same um, Templar holdings of the van at Mount Cadmus. The hospitaliers at the rear of Hattin, and that's where we're saying that it actually made it true. The, 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 the one of the, we think, in fact, we're not completely sure, but the, the Ayubid, one of the Ayubid uh, division that was cutting off its retreat, instead they break, they, they broke through it. Hospitaliers in the rear and the Templars in the van at Battle of Suf and in Galilee in 1204. The Hospitaliers in the van at uh, Caroublier in 1266. Refers of the Brethren motto is that being the first to attack and the last to retreat. Because at the end of the day, as we were saying before, this is what these military orders were conceptually created for. Right? They were created literally to to fight to the death in, 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 in many in many circumstances. So getting to feign in flight, there are these three forms we were hinting at before that should be distinguished every time you analyze a crusader powers. So one thing is actually the the strategical feigned flight, like a retreat lasting several days, designed specifically, like most of them actually in practice to wear the enemy uh, and draw him away from his bases but on a very long uh, uh, you know distance as a bait for a prearranged ambush that is to say you treat not because you just want to lure the enemy um, to exhaust him but to lure him in specifically into an ambush or as a deliberate provocation in the hope that the enemy would throw caution to the wind and charge him pursuit right thus disrupting his formation and actually these three objectives are to be found in every single feigned flight type because at the end of the day th th that the disorganization that derives from from the pursuit uh, whatever you want to see it eventually causes this th th always the same result there are many examples like the battle of Iran we've seen it in 1104 recently Sennabra in 1113 Harim 1164 Al Babay in 1167 Gaza 1239 and it seems the Franks also employed this ruse at some point Tancred right of Hauteville these were secular Normans so they were actually coming from the very you know uh, cradle of, of Western warfare um, in uh, you know in, in, from the Western Frankish tradition Tancred apparently at least feigned flight at a battle of Harta in 1105 it's very early um, and also William of Tyre describes in detail how Baldwin II employed these tactics against the Fatimids at Ascalon in 1125 right in connection with a concealed ambush dispatching this purpose um, a decoy um, body of light armed horsemen to lure the Muslims into his trap it's extremely early considering the news that we have first news we have of, of flank attack uh, because at the end of the day this is what what it was about in properly in Europe right start with Muret especially speaking of that it's possible that the units that were employed to carry out these feint flights were actually locals right we have seen the the uh, the use of turcopoles of this light armed horsemen as they're referred by the, the source uh, we have just mentioned Ascalon 1125 right so why would you employ your heavily armored knights to lure the enemy into an ambush if 
actually they're better spent in this dramatically powerful charge. I mean, it, it really depends. You may have uh, an easy game, but if you really have to do it, why don't you employ more expendable troops like the Turkopoles, right? We've seen how many sometimes the Turkopoles were, these were necessarily not even natives in the sense that just because you're a native you know the tactic. Actually among the Turkopoles there were probably many European-born uh, troops that were Franks. We know of Greeks that, uh, since the Turkopoles were famed, where you know they, they went, uh, f uh, you know, in the East, finding you know employment, saying to, stating the word Turkopoles themselves to be hired more easily. Um, and they they are the unit that at the beginning of the video we were saying to be often overlooked properly sometimes even concealed by the sources or at least you know not taken into adequate consideration they seem to have often preceded the knights that is kind of obvious that's the same thing that the Turkish horse archers do right and there is in this sense a lot of symmetry exactly because uh, you have this screen as much as the enemy has that of these troops that engage each other in very in the same way because they're literally the same units we find them in this position, for example, the Battle of Sarmin in 1115 at Ager Sanguinis in 1119, properly in advance of the knights. Or, or on the former occasion, actually, this is fighting as horse archers, but in both instances, they appear to have pushed onto the knights behind them as well. This was also a thing, right? The role of the squire, we were saying before, that said to the knight, you know, that brought, you know, spare horses, um, uh, you know, equi new equipment, water, water. You exhaust yourself. This is nothing to do even about the fact that the Near East has higher temperatures in Europe. This happened everywhere. Um, so this lighter trooper kept, you know, that is suited for this more flexible role, um, might as well be, in fact, as we were saying, a complete uh, Western European without no problem, right? Um, and therefore, we often don't understand what was wrong here. Sometimes the, the Christian sources do not even talk about the squires. So you can, how can you think you can distinguish between the Turkopoles and other troops? And properly, as we've seen now, that we're also mixed, generally speaking. The livre au roi seems to imply that this kind of troops was customarily placed in front of knights, stating that the constable's troop held the first place in battle after the Turkopoles. Right? So there was properly in different occasions the, the separations even of the two for reasons that are that are not strictly tactical, that probably where do these units come they're organic mostly, but also probably who they are, how what's the, the relation of trust in here and so on. And the Turkopoles here are understood to be more important as well, right? And therefore, uh, you can imagine a virus tactics here in being employed that are all based on this constant testing of the enemy's energy, you know, um, reserve, counter reserve, and it becomes very complicated just even to reconstruct these moves. We have very often just this information and nothing else. So, but we know from later, from more recent and better uh, documented times, of course, that these practices were there fundamentally. Um, on another occasion, the, um, the, the, these troops employed as horse archers in a skirmishing role took place during the Third Crusade where Richard Lionheart sent his archers forward in the van with the Turkopoles and crossbowmen to skirmish with the Turks and strive to press them till he could arrive. So it's very interesting that they were used to contain the enemy in time, because guess what, they can't run away themselves. Um, here, naturally, the containment should happen also on, on a certain ground, but the idea that, that it's this warms of troops that are go back and forth, you can't properly even picture as a single unit, because they, if you try to surround them, you outflank them they, they will try they will do the same right so poses uh, in general against the, the the horse archery of the Islamic armies the the same essentially the same enemy the same response right um, and um, 
the Turkobals were horse archers themselves, a as we've seen, albeit we shouldn't overly emphasize that this was always the case. Like, they could fight also as knights. We have evidence of thieves given in Cyprus by the Lusignan to Turkopoles that required, in terms of training, the, the equipment as knights. Uh, just a, a small part, but meaning that the, the Turkopoles, like, it was much just a name to define who these people were in their background, not necessarily and always that they, you know, that they fought as horse archers. Turkopoles were not just horse archers, they could be just as heavy as Frankish knights. But um, certain f sources, like even Bill William of Tyre, for example, that writes about them uh, for the Battle of al of 1167, says that they were, for the most part, useless, that could give them, you know, that there is always this contempt, right? Um, it, it, but this might have been, in fact, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, like a, uh, a result of Frankish, m m you know, um, arrogance over troops that they did, didn't appreciate or that tried maybe to, 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 to blame for, for the defeat or things like this because, as we've seen, you know, the Western warfare was all about charging straight. These guys were... It's not that they were unreliable, but they also fought in, in a different manner, tendentially. So, the point is, um, we we can we are often you know tricked maybe by certain moral judgments that may have actually nothing to do with the, the military competence of these people, right? And most of them would presumably also fight very closely with you know to the Franks, even as sergeants, for example. Are as the squires themselves, right? So um, it's very difficult to make a clear distinction. Uh, they could be used as scouts easily. Uh, we know in the rule of the order of the temple, for example, this is this this is the case. Um, there is another interesting point that is the the Frank. We we have talked a lot about the Turks, right? Um, and it is a mistake in here to think that th this is a, you know, it was a simplification, but it, it's a mistake to presume that all Islamic armies fought in the same way. Just using this horse archers, skirmishing tactics, and feigned flights uh, stereotypically. Now, the Turks were objectively most, most apt to do this, right? But, for example, the Arabs of Fatimid Egypt had different tactics. Um, they 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 employed of course Turkish horse archers, but mm, very occasionally we have seen them. For example, in Ramla eleven o five, but they were usually small units, right? And most of them actually fought in more shock fashion with sword, mace, couche, lance, like the, the same way actually the Turks did in their elite force. But Egypt was a more naturally more sedentarized power, was not so dramatically. Um, you know, invested like the, the Middle East, like the the the, the, the Abbasid um, area, Mesopotamia, by the, the Persianized and uh, Central Asian tradition of the steppes. Egypt had also a, a closer si similarity to to the West, uh, in, even in terms of chivalry and um, a recruited system and so on, right? Um, Usama, that was. Um, a Syrian by its own a mission then rather than an Egyptian Arab describes in detail how the legs, for example, should be held to best effect in the charge, held by the rider, quote, as tightly as possible with his hand and under his arm close to his side, and he should let his horse run and effect the required trust. Right. This um, the Fatimid armies, as we were saying before, had also a lot of infantry. Uh, rather than horsemen, I meaning here with important missile elements provided chiefly by the Sudanese Gulams, right, uh, that had pretty damn good uh, bows, actually long bows themselves. Um, and like the archers of the Franks, they usually preceded the cavalry in battle to eventually fall back also in, in the rear um, in the, of the troops. We've seen how the, those. Uh, pockets like those small units of uh, lighter infantrymen that could be, you know, supporting hand-to-hand -hand combat, but also in with missile fire. These were scattered, and they would retreat, just like the other, other light troops, including the Turkopoles, behind the infantry, the 
solid infantry wall, let's say, just like even heavier cavalry. Um, so for the Battle of Ramla, as we were saying before, properly the Sudanese, this inf largely infantry constituted one division entirely. This is very, very fascinating. Ibn Khaldun states that the Fatimids employed two principal formations in battle, this being the Persian tactic of advancing in line in organized division and the Bedouin or Berber tactic of attacking in small disorganized groups. Right, it also observed that the Persian method was the more sure of victory in being well organized and, quote, as impregnable as a continuous stone wall or strongly constructed fort. This is the obvious difference between civilized um, states, um, you know, uh, warfare and tribal warfare. Of course, Persia. Uh, Persia was uh, an interesting melting pot of military traditions, but let's say for what can here by Persian, it's actually meant the, you know, the, the caliphal. You know, the Abbasid Caliphate, and generally speaking, this, this idea, the Caliphate had developed on the base of the highly infrastructured, uh, urbanized Persian and Roman civilizations in the Middle East and Near East, in Egypt and so on. At this point, the, the Abbasid Caliphate, what, what remained of it technically was highly Persified, like the Persian influence has been dramatic, especially ever since the Caliphal um, capital was transferred the beginning from, uh, you know, to, to, to Baghdad, right? And Persian cultural influence has been massive and also naturally in warfare. So it was, as far as I understand, this is a title of honor rather than actually an ethnical, um, you know, reference. And, and naturally, this was meaning that, of course, that the Persian model was, the, was opposed to, in this case, the, the Berber one. So properly, the Maghreb, I mean, the Mashrib versus the Maghreb in terms of where the civilization stood and where it didn't. You know that the North Africa for the Muslim world has always been perceived as a kind of a barely civilized and even um, Islamicized uh, area. It was still, in, and it was objectively much more, you know, tradition, I mean, tribally based than, uh, you know, aside from the coastal civilizations, of course, Egypt was a major pull of this, but, you know, properly the Berber interland was, was just as tribes that you know could have very you know skilled horsemen since since the antiquity but had also very you know you know loose collective training given there was no state no proper um uh, you know system that could impart a serious military drill drill uh, discipline training so um this is the meaning of it and in in this sense Ibn Khaldun seems to stress the difference between let's say the, the Egyptian army as properly uh, could have been in Fatimid, Ayyubid or uh, Mamluk times and all these troops of uh, of barbarians because essentially was the Muslim consider, consider them then like you know it's barely Islamicide and uh, still living in these more primitive realities but still however were present as we know in fact in large numbers as well in, in their in their armies Right, and uh, it, it, the, actually the, the Turks fought in, had the similar thing, it's just that they were so much closer to the steps model that is kind of different between, you know, compared to the sedentary world to the civilized and uh, kind of tribal dichotomy that makes some, something on their own. Naturally also Egypt was dramatically influenced by steps warfare and uh, actually the whole world since the migration era in a way that we rarely understand uh, all over Europe the Mediterranean North Africa the Mashrek right you know the the, the uh, revived let's say the increase in importance of mounted warfare was be deeply felt and in this broader world that was really without boundaries even between peoples and um, cultures and so on um, so this is very interesting and archers formed usually the first rank in the Egyptian armies with the spearmen in the second and cavalry in the third right while well, elite units usually formed the, the center or the, the, the army's main standard flew the density of the formation depended on the strength of the enemy of course and uh, sometimes numerical superiority permitted an outflanking movement the Bedouins were 
often encountered in this role because of their mobility. Right? Sometimes you don't need order, but just troops to, to be broke in the rear of the enemy just to make him collapse. This is also the uh, the logic of the uh, of the ambush or the flank attack. You know, you really need a very few people, just a pocket of troops that is able, you know, a shock as a shock force to attack from the rear, from the flank, and even an entire like multiple hundreds cavalry units could be disrupted in its cohesion and order in an irreversible way. Right? This is particularly evident just also in, in 13th century European war, but it was exactly that. Right? Entire um, you know, lines of even 400, 500 men, you know, attacked by a like 60 uh, knights could, could crumble if attacked from the rear. It's extremely important, tactically speaking. Ayyubids and Mamluks, naturally, given also the continuity in the, in the Egyptian rule, employed s very similar formations to the one of the Fatimids. Uh, usually without infantry, because objectively, uh, as you know, Ayyubis and Mamluks were mostly like they, they came much f much closer from from the uh, steppes warfare than the Fatimids had done. They came, had a very different background. They were much more Turkic in, in nature, at least you know from from areas that had way more massively influenced by the steppes, Persian. Um, you know, Turkic and uh, many other types of warfare uh, in the Caucasus. Th these were largely, f there were Kurds, right, as you know, and also uh, they, there was a great melange of, of uh, ethnicities in this sense, the, in the Mamluk army especially. Come, people drawn from everywhere, retrained eventually in the chivalric fashion. For the, the Mamluks were very fascinated by what we made video on the so-called Saracen heraldry, the rank system of the Mamluks that shows in there how it's probably the closest society to 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 medieval to European feudalism in that sense that they were developing a sort of uh, heraldic symbol on their uh, symbolism on their own that was not so emphatically concentrated uh, like um, the idea of chivalry in this broader political and social system was more statile oriented as Egypt could provide as, as a system overall resourcefully but um, they were obsessed about cavalry like they had an enormous chivalric and question culture in, in, in that sense probably in a feudal direction rather in a, in a steps like but more in a organizationally like you know politically and socially like the Mamluks were seen to, to have normally drawn up in three divisions consisting of center, left, and right. We've seen that these three divisions were mostly used standardly by both Christians and Muslims throughout most of the... Um, and usually, even there are sources, we've seen it for the Battle of Raqqa, to say, you know, there were just two divisions, but then others say three, and uh, you, you know, most likely it's the case that it's three rather than two, right? It gives more flexibility, and um, th this was used in the West as well, so... Um, it, it was actually functional to that system, essentially, right? The elite units and the standards in the center, even in here, it uh, usually happened. The Al Alka was properly the center, and or the the royal Mamluks, while the Amirs contingents were on the flanks. So it was properly a yerk. The Mamluks cared a lot about this yerkis, generally speaking. Um, and the Mamluks, in a di so differently from the, the, the Westerners in some ways, but this is also in later times, so also in the West, the centrality of the monarchy, for example, was taken over, but not in such a uniquely tactical, in organizational sense on the field. Um, probably, then this is debatable, but uh, whatever. The Mamluks, in addition, placed auxiliaries on the extreme wings as well, usually Bedouins on the wing and Turkomans on the other, because every uh, the, the, since the, the time of the, the first Golems, naturally every ethnicity usually, albeit it was still mixed at some levels, held its own place properly on, at court as on the field, right? So there were certain places of honor and um, they the were never fully standard, but they were tendentially so. And in battle, it was not uncommon for one wing or, 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 or both, actually, to give way, right? Um, 
while the the victors and and and, and vanquish dashed from the field in pursuit of route and leaving the center to resolve the battle. This occurred, for example, at Acre in 1189, at Holmes in 1281, among others. Example. This is interesting because it makes you properly understand that uh, differently from Christian armies in many ways the center was probably more important um, and it was, it, this also depends naturally from which troops were employed but naturally Egypt was more unitary power so differently from crusader states this was less of a center usually right and therefore we have also a lot of battles in which there was probably no king like the only one one of Jerusalem could be present so even the divisions were sometimes there was a even in their place of honor in, in everything but they, they were more homogeneous tendentially in this skirmishers usually preceded the main body of cavalry either turkomans or the best marksmen um, imad for example describes how at atten saladin quote picked out the advance of guard uh, uh, advance guard of archers from each company, while at Arsuf, the Christian sources record uh, that light cavalry, quote, coming down at us in full charge and hurling darts and arrows as fast as they could, while the well-ordered phalanxes of the Turks, with ensigns fixed on their lances, were drawn up beyond them. So you see even here very well how um, it is more evident for the Egyptian forces how there was a shock component right more tenden tendentially than, than ours focused not much more necessarily on mobility or properly on the solidity of the ranks to form something you know comparable with uh, that could cope at least with the with the Franks but still with this important naturally skirmishing role in the front mostly represented by ethnic troops they were as we've seen specialized in that way just because of their tribal background right a bit like the Turks were originally just that they had way more troops in that sense um, infantry still sometimes preceded the cavalry right but under the Mamluks they they were extremely because the when you read the phalanx it's not necessarily just the infantry by the way it's the cavalry as well right this is something that existed since uh, it's very frequent actually especially in medieval Latin you read the phalanx, it's usually the cavalry or actually not much the infantry given the the different attention is you know the primary interest is for cavalry generally you understand it's that it's the ashes the phalanx it's the same thing actually and and we should make a vocab a dictionary of this stuff because it, it's useful for whoever wants to read that in Latin it should also be pointed out that in Mamluk times, infantry becomes rarer, right? There, w there was a few, m m you know, infantry recruited at Ok that properly wasn't part of the Mamluk army as such, that as you know was just a slave thing that uh, eventually became elite, um, as, a, as an army on its own, as a stadal army of, of the Sultan proper. They were mostly recruited from Syria, from Egypt, you know, lighter troops. Um, and as the Mamluks rarely ever fought and fought, it was considered humiliating. Right? It was a, a noble and ethnical and uh, tr tradition at the same time. For example, as early as 1192, the Itinerarium records that the following alleged debate between Saud Saladin's Mamluks and Kurdish soldiers. This is fascinating. He said, because the Turks said, you Mamluks will have to go on foot to seize the king and his people while we keep watch on horseback to cut off their flight towards the camp. And the Mamluks answer to them, it is rather you bus your business to go on foot, for we are nobler than you. We are content with that kind of warfare which rightly belongs to us, this foot service is your concern. Right? This is very... Um, and this tells you how the Mamluks, in fact, had iner inherited this kind of uh, steps-like mentality. Well, the Kurds were mostly um, mountaineers, traditionally speaking. I mean, they were, were extremely fine uh, cavalry among there as well. But the the Kurds had a, a they were actually in between the, the, in the in the eye of the storm in many ways. They were exposed to every ki possible kind of military culture. Um, including the Frankish one and so on, we'll have to make videos on this stuff. 
but the Mamluk lived in this sense. It was not even, I mean, I said, you know, even ethnical pride, because technically speaking, there was something about the original Mamluk units was, was ethnical, right? Eventually it became most like regiments, like something permanent that would be filled with people coming from literally everywhere, because the Mamluks recruited, you know, boat or raided these slaves from every frac every freaking where, including Russia, including, you know, they, they, they bought them from everywhere. Everywhere, right? Um, and, but it was about the cavalry thing, right? That originally speaking denoted the, the, the thing of the... And Kurds, even the Ayyubids were Kurds, technically, and that tells you how soaked they were in properly... Um, in, in this equestrian culture as well, but here the uh, I don't know how an uh, you know well it's not anachronistic because it's an early source, but it already stresses the difference between the the idea that uh, after all the, the Mamluks felt themselves as the noble guys on horseback, even under Kurdish uh, uh, you know originally Kurdish command. Right? But anyhow, uh, we stop here. We extended a little bit also on. Um, the Islamic tactics, but it's obviously important because if you study the, the Frankish ones, you, you you have to point out what uh, what's the generally speaking the the other one <laughs> um, as well. And so I don't know if we will. Uh, yes, well let, let's count it like Frankish and. Uh, so, tactics of the Crusades. Okay, I will change the title, doesn't matter from what I previously thought. We will talk about Crusader Warfare once again. Of course, uh, not just once, hopefully. Um, and for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.